All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. I wanna welcome everybody to our third session of the Boots in the Barn series. Glad everybody has been able to join us. Um, I know it's a little bit different way of having a Boots in the Barn. Typically we are actually out in the barn, but I think everybody's gonna enjoy today's session because our panelists have really taken us out to their farms. And I think that'll just give us a good, good perspective here. So as we start, um, just a couple housekeeping things before we do get started. If you wanna um, put anything into the chat box, you can at any time uh, during the presentation. So if you have questions, uh, we will take all the questions at the end of the session. So um, as you're thinking of them, just go ahead and type them in the chat box there. Um, I did have up on a previous screen, you know, if you want to tell us where you're from, if you're a dairy producer or industry person, uh, go ahead and type that into the chat box. If you have something that you want to share as far as a, a farm tip or farm hack that you use on your farm, go ahead and put that in there. We'll share ideas. Um, all of these sessions are going to be recorded and archived. So uh, those that have been on before, you know you're gonna get a follow-up email with the recordings that you can go back and view at a later time. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to introduce our three uh, dairy women that we have on the uh, webinar here today. Uh, we're first gonna start with Erin Titterington. She's the herd manager for her family dairy operation out in Northwest Iowa, so Jones Dairy. And then we'll follow with Carissa Butcher, who's a herds person for Schonbacher Acres in Eastern Iowa. And then we'll finish up with Minnie Ward, who owns and operates a custom heifer growing business in Southeast Minnesota. So um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Erin, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna play your video first. Um, so we'll make this, can everybody see the video still? Okay. And then I'm gonna hit play on that. Hi, my name is Erin Titterington. I'm the manager at my family's fourth generation dairy. We are located in Northwest Iowa between Spencer and the Lake Okopoji area. I was blessed to grow up on an 80 cow dairy farm, being the oldest of eight siblings. Today, my brother and I are full time at our current farm, but the whole family gets involved from time to time, either at breakfast on the farm or giving help in their areas of expertise. My husband and I have two sons, ages nine and 11. One of the most fulfilling things about farming is getting to work with my children and watch them grow and develop interests in farming. Um, they also help my husband on his family's cropping operation. So they are definitely little farmers at heart. My son Lucas was fortunate this summer to be asked by the Midwest Dairy Association to join them in a joint project with the Iowa Agricultural Literacy, Literacy Foundation in making a My Family's Dairy Farm book. He has had so much fun with this book. It is available now to all third grade and second grade teachers throughout the Midwest. Um, they can get it for their classrooms or for their students to educate about what goes on on a modern day dairy farm. My parents, Patrick and Nancy, have nine grandchildren and three more on the way. And we hope that the future of the farm sees several of them being involved in it. We milk 1100 jerseys in a double 12 parallel parlor. We milk 21 hours a day and uh, most of the pens are milked 3x just a couple pens are milked 2x so that we can stay in the 24-hour window i'm just going to give you a quick tour our cows are in um, tunnel ventilated barns we've really grown to love the tunnel ventilated because neither us nor our cows are very cold weather tolerant so tunnel vent allows us to stay a little warmer and not freeze in the winter and it has been great on most all summer days when the humidity gets really high and the temperature is high it's i don't think every place is miserable unless you actually have air conditioning we do bed with uh, green salads the reason we built this barn this barn with the scrapers is so that we could have a consistent quality supply of green salads separated from a day pit our other facilities are slats and um, we are slatted facility aficionados because 
we enjoy not messing with the manure on a day to day basis. However, with the slatted pits, we were not able to get a consistent quantity or quality of bedding solids. This uh, system has worked great for us. We have a fan separator that runs four to six hours a day and separates manure from 480 cows to make bedding for 1200. So all milking and dry are bedded with the green solids on top of mattresses with a skid loader affixed with a side shooter. We bed on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Dry cows are bedded once a week. We appreciate having this source of bedding that we make and control the quality over ourselves. We feed our cows one time a day um, and push up feed several times throughout the day. Feed is gotten down in the mornings with a rake and stockpiled near the mixing area so that nobody is running for feed during mixing times. We're fortunate to harvest most of our own crops. Here we're harvesting rye with all crop head. We utilize cover crops, harvest a small amount of them, but plant cover crops following the silage chopper or um, following baling stalks every fall. Here we're merging alfalfa. Our ration consists of haylage and uh, silage and earlage. And then we also harvest rye for in stockage for use in the dry cow rations. We used to bale a lot of stock bales and we still do to use for bedding, but not for feeding. Um, instead for feeding, we'll follow the earlage operation and uh, run the stalks that are left over through the chopper. This makes a rough product that we put in a drive over pile and cover to use for dry cows. Um, bunker management, we line all the bunker walls with plastic and uh, use oxygen barrier cover as soon as possible. Um, try to do all the right things to keep shrink as low as possible. Um, switching back to the cow side of the operation, we have about three calves per day. We calve in group calving pens where the cows are in their group pens with their same friends for about a week to eight days before calving. We let the cows lick the calves just a bit um, and then we carry them to the warm room or load them into a sled and take them to the warm room where they are weighed, vaccinated, dehorned, and fed. Calves are fed immediately as soon as we find them. Uh, the vast majority of our calves are fed with Genesis. It's a 150 gram classroom replacer that comes with a disposable tube feeder. You just fill to the line with warm water and shake. This ensures that even if somebody has a very limited amount of time, they find the calf and they get the classroom into the calf ASAP. Uh, every once in a while, a calf will be born while we're milking our hospital cows. We have a hospital cow parlor right in our transition barn area. And so we will feed a first feeding with the milk from the mother. Otherwise, calves receive that milk from their mother during the next time that we milk. So this calf was being tubed now at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning and then she will be fed either by tube if she won't suck or by bottle with her mother's classroom this afternoon. We were kind of grandfathered in on the classroom replacer in that 20 years ago, we started having a lot of pressure from Yonis. So we went to the replacer and we became addicted to the convenience. Right now, I understand that classroom is definitely better but this for us is the simplest way to make sure that it's done promptly, correctly, and um, we can limit a lot of steps and a lot of potential for error by using the classroom replacer. Also at birth, 
After colostrum, the Cavs receive Inforce 3, the internasal vaccine, Ultrabac C and D sub Q, and they'll get an EID tag, a numbered ear tag, and be weighed. The next step for us in taking care of a newborn calf is dipping her navel. We use the stronger iodine and Dixie cups. We use the Dixie cups for one or two calves and then we throw them away. The navel will be dipped now when she's brand new and then also when she has her second feeding of colostrum. Then we stand her up, make sure she can stand up, get her blood moving. Um, the next step will be putting paste on the Jersey calf's horns. And I will show you the same canned video that all the people on our farm who decorn calves with paste have to watch. And anybody who tells me they aren't sure about pasting on their farm has to watch. And I credit my friend Laura for getting me up to speed on pasting. And here is the video. Okay, today we're gonna do a short video on how to dehorn a calf with paste. A lot of people have questions about dehorning and are worried that it hurts the calves. But really when you do it in the first day of age, they just sleep and they don't even really know. So the first thing that we, is really important is a very sharp pair of scissors to trim the hair and keeping the paste in the fridge so that it's not too runny. So first thing we're gonna do is feel where the, the uh, horn butt is. And in, especially in these jerseys, it's very easy to feel a little bump, but also to find a place where there's no hair growing. So what we wanna do is trim the hair, just like that, so we have that bump exposed. Take the scissors and lightly brush over the, so that we brush the waxy substance on top of the horn off. And we're gonna repeat the process on the other side. And then we're finished with our scissors. For the paste, we want to make sure that we wear gloves. I put it on my arm to try it out one time and it does burn quite a bit pretty quickly. So soap and water though instantly um, removes the burn, but still good to wear gloves. So we're going to put about a, a large chocolate chip size on there and then I use the end to kind of spread it around so that we cover the whole space of that horn butt. Go ahead and repeat for the other one. I'm not sitting on her, but I am holding her still with my knees. But I'm not sitting all the way on her, so hopefully it doesn't look like it smashed here. And that's all there is to it. You want it to be a little thick, but definitely not too much. It needs 30 minutes to set, not be bumped into by anybody else. And as you can see, she feels fine. Um, she's not trying to itch it or anything. Sometimes this will fall off after that 30 or 40 minutes, so that's just fine. Um, we always just recheck to make sure it hasn't smeared and if it does get on their eyes, you wanna clean that excess off. Right now we're having 50 to 60% of our calves being born are Jersey heifer calves. And then obviously there's a few Jersey bulls and we're aiming for the other 50% to be full blood beef calves from embryos. Um, it's a work in progress. Uh, conception isn't quite where we would like on the embryos, but I do believe it is the most sustainable contribution to the beef market moving forward. So that's kind of what we're working on in that area now. Uh, just a quick look at our hospital cow parlor, our cows our milk here when they freshen and um, if they need any special attention or antibiotics, they come back and stay here. We save the good milk to pasteurize and use for feeding calves. We pasteurize that in a 40 gallon westward pasteurizer. And uh, then we mix that pasteurized milk half and half with a 2525 milk replacer. We have our old milk taxi that we used to have mounted on the back of our Kawasaki mule to feed with. Uh, in a fixed position here, we use that to mix the milk placer. It is excellent for mixing, heating, and then, like I said, we use that half and half mix. 
We try to be a little over the top when it comes to cleaning our calf utensils. We run about 100 bottles, so we do have a bottle washer. Bottles go through warm, soapy water with Dawn in it, and then through two cycles of acid and detergent in the bottle washer. As soon as our calves are dry and running around good, they are moved out to individual calving pens. They will remain in their individual pens until three weeks. Around that time, they'll either be, the dividers will be pulled out and they will be combined and be in pairs, or they will move to our group calving pens if there's space where they'll be in a group of 18 or so and they drink out of headlocks. Calves live in group housing following weaning in one of several different barns. They eat out of self feeders and um, at about seven, five to seven months, depending on where we were, are as far as space, they will move into our heifer barn, which is slats and headlocks. It's a tunnel vented barn. It stays fairly climate neutral. We breed them in this barn and they will leave when they are two to three months pre-calving to go to our transition barn where they'll hopefully learn about laying in a stall prior to freshening. That is all for our quick snapshot of our farm. Thank you very much for listening and have a good day. Okay, Erin, I stopped the video and do you have any comments before we move on to the next one? Do you have any or just say hi and introduce yourself a little bit so we know the group knows who, which one is Aaron here. It's weird watching your own video and I really hadn't watched it all together just because I want to turn into you and I thought I'd be making changes. But I see I cut my head off and stuff in a couple of places. But anyway, no, I just, I'm, hi, I'm Aaron and um, thanks for watching my video and hope we can have some good discussion. I'm anxious to see everybody else's stuff. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, I think if you if you're able, you could give her a virtual clap. If you go down to the reactions, there's um, thumbs up, there's claps. I'm gonna give her a thumbs up. So awesome! You know, can't be in person. We're <laughs> clapping for you. So thanks. And Carissa, if you just give me a second, I need to open up. Um, I need to open up your video. It looks like I need to. Just give me a second here, Carissa, while I find it. No worries. <laughs> Make sure I have it uh, loaded here before we get started. Oops. Okay. Okay, now I can share your PowerPoint. Are you able to see that, Carissa? Yep, looks good. Okay, so you are ready to go. All right, so my name is Carissa. Um, I'm the assistant herdsman for a 280 cow dairy located near Atkins. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we milk twice a day. We are a closed herd, so uh, all of our cows have actually been born on our farm. We don't buy anything in. Um, it's a family run operation. Uh, Jay, Barb, Alan, and Joyce Schombacher are the owners. Uh, we have four full-time employees and about seven part-time employees. Um, a lot of our part-timers are high school and college kids that uh, do the afternoon milking. Um, I've been here for about 12 years. I am now the assistant herdsman and I actually never touched a cow a day in my life before I got hired here. So everything that I know about cows, I have learned on the farm from my boss and also by attending meetings um, like this about dairy things. So uh, go ahead and play the video, please. Okay, and while I'm getting that going, do you just wanna explain what your video is going to be about? Oh, yeah, I suppose that'd be good. So on our farm, we um, use blood sampling for preg checking all of our cows and heifers, as opposed to having the vet come out and do it. 
and my video just kind of talks about that and shows you how to take a blood sample. <clears throat> Welcome to Schumbacher Acres. Uh, we milk about 280 Holstein cows. Uh, this is our big freestall barn. We've got fresh cows in this pen over here. They stay there till about 25, 30 days in milk. We've got two year olds in this pen here. And then we've got a third group back there, just kind of a mix of cows. And fourth group is our high somatic cell cows. Uh, these girls get fed TMR once a day and we just keep pushing up feed throughout the day. One thing that I think is unique about us is our cows are wearing collars. So these blue collars are actually activity monitors. Uh, they simply do activity monitoring, heat detection. There is no temperature sensor, no rumination monitor, nothing. These are just kind of original heat detection, but they work really, really good for us and we love them and they're still going strong. So the cows get their collar at about 20 days in milk. It establishes a baseline for her. And then at 70 days in milk, once she comes into heat, we breed her. If she doesn't come into natural heat for breeding, then she'll go on our time day eye list. Uh, once she gets bred, we do a blood sample at 35 days after breeding. If that comes back pregnant, then we wait and we blood sample again at 60 days after breeding. And if that comes back pregnant, we say that she is verified pregnant and then we take the collar off and we use it on a different cow. So a lot of these cows here are actually not wearing collars because they've already been verified pregnant. Uh, so for supplies for blood sampling, it's actually pretty simple. You need some three mil uh, vacuum tubes here or really any size works. We just like three mil because they're smaller and you need some multi-sample blood collecting needles. So it's actually got, it's got your needle on the one end and then a rubber covered needle on the bottom. Uh, what you're gonna do with these, you're gonna put this end into the cow's tail. And once that's in, then you will slide this end into the rubber stopper uh, in order to keep the vacuum seal on the tube. We purchase all of our blood sampling supplies from Leadstone. Uh, you can get them from any vet supplier. You can even get them on the Bioprint website. I think they're maybe slightly more expensive from uh, Bioprint, but uh, we buy a box of 100 needles and 100 blood tubes at a time and just use them as we need them. We're milking 280 cows and typically I'll do around 15 blood samples a week on average. Welcome to Schumbacher Acres Heifer Facility. Here is our breeding age pen. Uh, all of our heifers in here are around 13 months old. Some are a little bit young yet, but we start breeding at 13 months old. Uh, the best thing that we've done over here in recent years is we installed these headlocks. So every morning we run the belt feeder, we feed corn silage and a top dress grain mix to our breeding age heifers. And they come in and they lock up and that way we can breed anyone that needs to be bred. Uh, Monday mornings, is when I come over from the dairy and I do blood sampling and I move collars around. Uh, we do use collars for heat detection on our heifers here as well as our cows over at the dairy. All right, so we found a heifer that needs a blood sample. We've got our needle and our vacuum tube vial. Open it up. I like to just hold it in my mouth. We're gonna lift the tail. And you're gonna look and feel for the groove right in the very center of the tail, going at roughly a 90 degree angle. And then attach your tube to your needle. Blood should start flowing, fill it up. And then I just put my fingers on the backside to try and stop the bleeding a little bit. Uh, these are three milliliter tubes. You actually only need two mils for them to do the sample. So if you don't have it completely full, that's totally fine. Uh, put the cover back on my needle, stick it in my pouch, and label the tube with my Sharpie. Got pepper 180. And that's that. So today is Tuesday morning. Um, on Tuesday mornings at our farm is when we do all of our timed AI, our shots, and taking our collars off and on our cows, and that's also how we're able to make blood sampling for preg checking work. 
So uh, Tuesday morning is when we take blood samples from the cows that need it. Uh, so today, oh, we uh, run everyone from the holding pen into the parlor, they get milk, and once they're done milking, everyone comes through this management rail on Tuesdays. Um, so today we are going to blood sample 704. So you got your needle and your vacuum tube. Just uh, don't poke into your vacuum tube until after the other end of your needle is in the cow. Otherwise, you'll ruin that vacuum and you won't be able to get your sample. So we just lift the tail and look through that center line. You can see it and you can also feel it. Go in about a 90 degree angle and then try not to poke yourself with the needle while you attach it to the vial and it should start filling. And then uh, put your needle away and make sure to label your tube with your cow. Okay, Carissa, I'm going to pull up your slide set again. Okay, so my slideshow kind of just goes a little more in depth and it's a little bit repetitive too of what was in the video, but we'll just go through it here quick and um, yeah, feel free to type any questions in the uh, chat box. So how it works, uh, cattle can be determined, be determined pregnant or open based on the amount of a pregnancy specific protein pregnant in their blood. Uh, the proteins are produced by the placenta of the growing fetus. So you can blood test as early as 28 days after breeding. A second test should be done 60 to 80 days after breeding uh, because a certain number of cows will lose their pregnancy early on. Uh, we use a company called Bioprint for our testing and their website is listed there. So our cows, we sample at 30 days after breeding. And then in our computer, we enter them as either open or pregnant. And then if they were pregnant, we'll sample again at 60 days and then enter that result as open or verified. Um, heifers will sample at 45 days. I used to sample at like 35 days, but I was just having too many that were open later on after I moved them into the pregnant barn, then they'd start showing a heat again. So I, I backed this up to 45 days, probably about six months ago, and it seems to be helping. Um, you shouldn't need to do a second sample on heifers. Um, typically they don't lose a pregnancy. We're probably, you know, the one out of 1000 that seem to be losing some in there, but then I just grab another blood sample if I'm curious about her um, and just make sure that she actually is open and not just showing some weird heat. Um, so how we are able to implement uh, blood sampling is that Tuesday mornings is already shot morning on our farm. So all of our milk cows go through the management rail immediately after milking before they go back to the freestyle barn. So I have a to-do list which tells me who needs a seeder, who needs PGH, GNRH, vaccines, blood samples, and then we also take collars off and on so that we don't have to have a collar for every single cow. Um, we just uh, share them between cows after after one is verified pregnant, then we'll take that off of her and put it on somebody else. Pros and cons of blood sampling. Um, pros for us is it's easily integrated into our Tuesday morning protocol. Um, our vet is an hour and a half away, so it's just easier for us to preg check ourselves. We don't need to sort or move the cows or reclean the parlor and the management rail, which is what we used to have to do when we would use the vet for preg checking. Um, it only requires one person. Back when the vet would come, it would have like, we'd have like three or four people out there plus the vet sorting and moving cows. Um, it's a little more economical for us. It costs about $2.50 to get the sample tested and approximately 39 cents in supplies. And then you pay a little bit of shipping. Typically we receive the results within the week. Uh, some bad things about blood sampling for preg checking is we cannot determine the age of the fetus. So sometimes we kind of just have to guess which breeding she was pregnant to if it's a questionable cow. Um, we also cannot determine the sex of the fetus. So we don't know until she calves what type of calf she's having and we cannot identify twins. Um, you do have to learn to find the vein without losing your vacuum. I know I struggled with that when I first started doing this. I cried a few times, not gonna lie. A few other times I put the cow in the headlock and took some blood from her jugular. Um, but once you get good at it, it's really easy. 
And another con is that once in a while, the post office is kind of slow in getting our samples to uh, the bioprint lab. So we don't always get our results in a timely fashion. Uh, cost and supplies. So you need blood vials and needles. The blood vials, we buy monoject blood collection tubes. We prefer the three milliliter size. It's smaller. Um, technically, they only need like two mils to run the test. Um, so we do the three mil because then there's less weight to ship. So it's cheaper to ship if you're only doing three mils versus like a five mil tube. Um, cost us $31 for 100 tubes. The needles, we get a 20 gauge by one inch or one and a half inch. I really prefer the shorter, the one inch. I've gotten a lot better with those. We, we used to always use one and a half inch long needles and then we accidentally ordered the wrong size and they were one inch and I had to use a whole box of those. And at first I hated them, but now I love them. <laughs> Um, cost us $8 and 50 cents for hundred needles. I want to say on the bioprint website, they were charging like 30 bucks for their needles. So they were a bit more expensive. So in total, I figure it's close to $3 and 22 cents per blood sample. It costs us roughly $5 to ship a box of like, say 15 samples. It's just a kind of an approximation there. So, um, to collect the blood. You want to direct the needle upwards, um, but not between a vertebrae. Um, if you go between the vertebrae, you might go too deep and pass through the vein. Um, I don't, that's, that's what I got off the Bioprint website. I think I've gone through, but you just kind of pull back out a little bit. And sometimes you just have to wiggle around and eventually blood will start flowing. Um, but if you wiggle too much, the blood might stop flowing. Um, you can just kind of poke around again, just being sure not to remove the needle from the tail. Cause if you do that, then you're gonna ruin the vacuum and your blood tube will be junk and you have to start over with a new one. Um, use a new needle for every animal because you can get cross contamination. Uh, maybe this girl's pregnant and the next girl's open, but if you use the same needle, there could be cross contamination and you might not get accurate results. Remember to label every tube with your animal's ID um, so like in the video, I'm right-handed, so I lift the tail with my left hand, find the center line. I usually just kind of rub it with my finger to make sure I can see it and feel it. Um, insert the needle about a half an inch and perpendicular to the tail. I like to go close to the base of the tail. It's a lot easier. You can go um, out farther, but the vein is still there. Uh, attach the vacuum vial to the rubber-coated end of the needle. And then again, do not remove it from the tail until your vial is full. And if the blood's not flowing, just kind of poke around a little bit without removing the needle from the tail. So to ship the samples, each, um, each vial is already labeled with your animal ID. So like the top one there is cow 160 and then cow 173 and then 175. Um, so play small in numerical order and then assign an additional number to each tube starting with number one. So like 160, she's tube number one, 173 is tube number two, and then fill in the form from Bioprint with each animal ID and its corresponding tube number. And then you're also gonna write how many days after breeding did you take that sample and whether she's a cow or a heifer. So there on the sheet, uh, you'll see we put all of our heifers first at 45 days after bread with an H for heifer. And then our cows, we had some 60 dayers. And then after that, we've got our 34 dayers. <clears throat> uh, to ship the samples, bundle them together with rubber bands in sets of approximately eight. Wrap each bundle in a couple half paper towels, put those in a snack size Ziploc, and then put them in the box. Uh, we add packing peanuts, or sometimes we just use like plastic grocery sacks to stuff them in there for extra padding. Write biohazard on the back of the submission form. Add your check for $2.50 per sample. Tape it shut, add an address label, and then put a sticker on there for exempt animal specimen. I don't exactly know what that does, but they want that on there if you're shipping animal blood through the post office and then take it in and send it. So to interpret the results, this is the sheet that we get emailed to us each week with our results. 
Um, they're usually emailed the same day that your samples get processed. So we usually send the samples in the mail on Tuesday and get the results on Friday. The limiting factor here is how fast the post office gets them to the lab. So during Christmas and other holidays, sometimes it can take two to three weeks before we get results because the post office is so slow. But outside of those times, typically we have the results the same week. So any cows that come back open will actually get placed on time to AI the following Tuesday, unless they've been bred before then. So that's why we want results in a timely manner is to identify any of those open cows and get them on time to AI as soon as possible, um, if need be. So we also use blood tests for questionable cows that may be almost ready to dry. Sometimes I have a dry cow that's questionable and I'll just grab some blood from her because I've not learned how to palpate very well yet. That's something I actually wanna work on and learn more is palpating and um, feeling a good pregnancy and stuff. Um, and so anyways, the blood tests will usually tell us accurately if she's open or not. So there in the test results, you can see, oh, sorry, tube number one, we labeled all those one, two, three, four, five. So tube number one belongs to a heifer called 182. So then the response that you look at is that 0.433 um, shows us that she's pregnant. And if you look down lower at an open cow, it's usually like a 0, 0.0 something. So that's um, how they're determining that. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, that's my presentation. If you have any questions, you can definitely email me directly or uh, just type them in the chat box here at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Carissa. And like she said, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the ch chat box as we're going along here. Uh, appreciate Carissa uh, providing that presentation and a really detailed explanation for how to do that blood sample. I think it's great to see that demonstration and uh, and and also telling us you're a little bit nervous about taking blood samples when you first started because that's something, you know, not everybody is comfortable with when they first get going on it, but it seems like you picked up on it really really quickly. Yeah, I, I got thrown into it. I would be the one that would do it when the boss would go on vacation. So, you know, like twice a year, maybe I would be doing it. And it, it was very stressful back then. But now that I do it every week, it's, it's really easy. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Carissa. And Minnie, I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint here. And oops, got to go back one. Oops. Okay. Yep. Are you able to see that many? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Perfect. Well, welcome everybody. Um, the last of the three presenters and my obviously is a lot shorter than theirs. Um, they did a phenomenal job on their videos. Um, so we are located in Southeast Minnesota. My, a little bit of background um, on where and where we've come from is um, quite a few years ago, I was a herdsman at, at a, a couple of large dairies and just navigated um, back into the passion for calves. And with that being said, then I was introduced into the nutrition world where I did calf and heifer nutrition um, for a couple of different feed companies along my um, career path and always wanted um, to be more hands-on once I left the dairy because I, I truly did miss those, those calves. Um, the last area I worked on, I managed all their calves um, pre-fresh or post-fresh, uh, bred all the heifers on the farm. So really, um, I, I really felt that need to come back into the dairy inter industry. And um, when I was working for the nutrition company, um, I had the opportunity to start my own custom um, calf operation. My husband, um, being a non-farm background, embraced it and came along for the ride. And here we are um, 14 years later, um, you know, doing, doing very well and have got a couple of really great producers that we work with. So, um, with that, like I said, this is just kind of a, a rough overview of our operation in uh, a five minute synopsis. So I think you can move to the video. Hi. 
Hi, I am Minnie Ward, and I am here at our um, small calf ranch in southeast Minnesota. And we custom raise uh, for a dairy, um, which is about two hours away from us. And uh, so Jen has asked me to do a little bit of a, a bio here about our operation and about what we do as far as um, how we raise our heifers here for this dairy. I'm gonna kind of turn it around. Um, as you can see here, we have hutches and um, we've got um, some agroplastic, we have some calf tails, um, and we have a transition barn um, along with a couple of super condos. When we get our calves, we get calves once a week, uh, usually on a Wednesday, and um, we get calves that are anywhere from two days old to seven days old, depending on um, the calvings of the dairy and um, you know the status of the calf as far as um, when they're born. So we do kind of an evaluation here at um, Fallen Oaks Custom Calves. We start with basically, um, let me get in front of a, a calf here. This little calf is always um, such a friendly little one. She is roughly um, two weeks old. And as you can tell, I tend to do my evaluations at feeding time. Um, that is when the calves are probably the most aggressive and you can actually interact with the calves and see what the calves are, um, you know, if they're going to be giving you a sign. And I always tell producers that they tell us a story every day and it is our job to pick up on what they are telling us. So um, this little calf here, like I said, she is um, a couple of weeks old. You know, I, I look at their eyes. Are their eyes bright? Um, are they aggressive like this calf is? You know, um, we do pair house. And so um, like the little one you just saw over there, if that calf comes um, and it's an odd number, they will not get paired. Um, somebody is going to be, you know, left in a calf hutch by themselves. Um, as in this little girl right here. And those calves, um, usually they come to us. They are already pale trained. Um, once in a while, we have to put calves on bottles. But typically when I get calves, I look at, you know, their disposition. Are they bright eyed? Do they have a really nice hair coat on them? Um, is their nose moist? Um, do they drink aggressively or are they kind of, you know, um, a little bit timid? If they're timid, they're telling me something. Something isn't right. They should be pretty aggressive um, when they come. Usually the dairy that brings calves um, come in the morning. And so they have, the calf has all day to acclimate, right? And so usually at, in the evening, they are ready to be um, fed. This is our, our super hutch there. Those are calves that are um, going through the weaning process. And uh, they do get worked. Um, so our protocol when we are weaning is, is they get dropped down to once a day feeding. Um, and then obviously all the water they can drink as well. Um, winter time, you know, that's always tricky for all of us out here in the field, right? Um, but we try to do our best in giving those calves the water they need. When they come into the barn, like I said, we, we do a transition period. Um, and they come into the facility here where um, they do get grouped with probably, I would say, another 20 calves that are in that um, same process of being weaned. We, we try to keep those calves a little bit closer to us. Um, so we can watch them and evaluate them as well. Um, we do use a milk taxi here. This is my mixing room. And um, I tell you, this has been a saving grace um, for the consistency factor because it's not just myself that feeds calves here. It is also my husband and my daughter. Um, and so with the milk taxi, we are able to keep the temperature consistent, the volume we're feeding consistent. Um, some of the tricks of the trade, I will show you in my PowerPoint. 
um, that I use and we use here at our operation to keep, you know, um, the consistency factor is, as um, even keel as possible. From um, here, you know, we, we mix, we um, clean pails, we do all that kind of stuff in my mixing room here. Um, when they come across the wall, they um, go into basically group pens of um, either, I would say, 20 to 30 calves in a pen. Um, our mixture here that we feed them is a corn, oats, um, and a pellet. It's a 20% that the calves actually really do very well on. When we wean them, um, I would say the majority of our calves are eating five pounds of grain um, on an average when we wean, which I think is pretty darn good. When they come across that wall into the back of the barn here, um, they get the same grain mix but they are also introduced to sorghum sedan grass. Um, it's a baleage, which there again, um, the condition on these animals I've been very pleased with. The dairy is very happy. Um, so with that being said, I will um, wrap up my little preview here of the, the uh, tour. And any questions can be directed to Jen. Thanks. Okay, so that video was really distorted. I apologize for that. Um, so the phase two is the older I get, the less I wanna be um, working calves and hutches. And so we are looking at this spring, putting in a, um, a uh, cross ventilated barn with an auto feeder um, to accommodate 100 calves on milk. And as you can see there in the yellow, that is kind of where we're going to be placing our barn. Um, so we can utilize the outside lots um, from the transition facility and make it user friendly for whoever is, is moving cattle. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jen. So the incoming protocol on, on our operation at the dairy, they, um, they dip navels, they ID and they tag, they do an Enforce 3 um, with a tri-shield pace as well. We are going to be moving um, away from the once PMH and the Enforce 3 to a new product that Merck is coming out. It incorporates both of those products into one internasal and that's called Bovalis um, Nasal Gen 3 PMH. And pretty excited about that, um, just to see if we can add a little bit more uh, uh, protection to that calf. At our place, like I said, they come to us every Wednesday, usually in the mornings. Um, so we let them acclimate. I don't push the calf that evening um, to, to feed. I kind of let them tell me what it's what they're going to be like um, for that evening feeding. but. The next morning, um, I, I do really, you know, encourage them and make them drink. That two-hour ride is is a pretty stressful event on any animal, but I think on the younger calf, it's it's even more prevalent. And uh, so I I don't really force them. I do electrolytes, uh, free choice, the first few days when we do arrive um, at our place. But then, like I said, we we kind of just put them into our protocol as far as feeding. Um, I do feed milk replacer. Um, I don't have access to any whole milk, but we feed a 2420 milk replacer. Um, I've got some probiotics in there. Um, I've got Selmanex in that milk replacer. And so the calves do fairly well. I try to achieve a 13% solid. Sometimes, you know, this winter it's been pretty, pretty decent out. So I really haven't increased that, but if it would drop below zero, I would certainly increase that solids to probably a 14%. Um, I use a refractometer to measure that. Um, it's the easiest tool that I have available to us that my husband uses, I use, my daughter uses it. And um, so it's, it, like I said in my video, I'm all about consistency because if you can keep it as simple and consistent as possible for those calves, they, they should have success. Um, so once they are on milk, we, we bed twice a week. Um, this year I've used more shavings than I have straw, just because keeping them dry has been such a challenge. And 
Um, with that being said, this, the shaving seems to do the, the trick for us a little bit more over than the straw. Now with this cold snap coming into place, um, straw is in place. So like I said, we, we bed twice a day. Um, it is a little bit more challenge with pair housing calves because there is two calves in a hutch. I do like um, the pair housing because it stimulates, I think, a little bit more aggression on those calves. The competition is obviously there um, to stimulate uh, feeding and grain starter especially. So um, from there, they stay in there till about 50 to 60 days, depending on the flow of cattle coming through our facility. Um, we move them from the calf hutches into the super condos just as a transition. And we do vaccinate there with Enforce 3 once PMH. Um, we do a boba shield gold at that time. And then we do dehorn um, with, we do cauterize. And uh, I use basically transdermal as kind of my pain mitigation on that. Um, and, and it works well for us. The dairy, um, you know, we, I, I really challenge the dairy to do the pasting, but um, on our operation here, that's what we do. So um, you can go to the next slide. So as I said in, in my PowerPoint, um, I really do evaluations on those and I really want the dairy that we are um, working with at the time to know the whys and the hows of what I want in a, in a newborn calf coming to me. So it's, it's really important for them to know as well as, you know, here um, on our operation, if anybody would come in, like I said, we're, we're a smaller operation. So it's just the three of us, um, my husband, myself and my daughter that do the day-to-day -day chores here. So communication um, obviously is critical. I do travel, um, both my husband and I have full-time jobs off the farm as well. So we have to communicate and it's, it's pretty easy with the three of us, but if we would ever have to go anywhere else, um, the people need to know the, the whys and the hows of what I expect um, when I'm looking at a, a calf. So the next screen. So the daily, the daily checks, right? So if I am looking at a calf, um, you know, like I said, I, I really do my evaluations at feeding time. So are they aggressive? Are they alert? Um, has anybody backed off on milk at all? Because they're telling you a sign there. Um, are they leaving any refusals? Um, and then we, we also track that as well. So refusals meaning milk diet and grain intake. So we, we monitor that as well. Next. So the ears, are the ears um, alert? Are they, you know, um, erect when they come out? Are they moving aggressively? Um, eyes, are they sunken in or do they have that glazed over look? That, that's a concern of mine. Um, the noise, I, the nose, I like to have it moist, um, nice and pink in this kind of weather. If it's, if it's a little bit off or gray or white, there again, they're telling me a sign and I need to pick up on what it is. I do run blood samples from time to time um, just to see if we've got, you know, some um, selenium or iron deficiencies in those calves. We do total proteins um, also on those calves and that'll kind of tell me whether that calf is going to um, achieve a goal of average daily gains on our operation or if it's going to give me a struggle later on um, and have more issues um, down the road. So then from there, I look at um, breathing rates with calf jackets on this time of the year, that's a little bit harder, um, but you can kind of tell whether that calf is moving appropriately and if it's uh, breathing a little bit heavier and you can kind of tell that when it's drinking its milk as well. Um, in this kind of weather, like I said, we use calf jackets. If it's uh, a smaller calf or an extremely cold weather event coming through, I will double jacket calves. Um, and my rule of thumb is, is those jackets go on when we start putting hoodies on it. And, and I'm usually the first one around to put a hoodie on because I, I tend to get a little cold pretty fast. Um, but that's kind of my rule of thumb and, and everybody knows that works with me, um, that that's kind of what I expect. So I'm all about conserving that energy and, and making that calf grow um, both on an immune status and on a, a gain point. 
So um, hair coat again, you know, is it nice and shiny or is it really dull and brittle and flaky? Um, there again, if, if those start happening, I look at my water source a lot. We have pretty poor water at our place here. And so I'm constantly monitoring water quality and products being put in. We do um, treat our water with chlorine dioxide. And I have to say with that additive going into our, our well system and we treat our house, we treat the barn. Um, I have noticed a better um, calf overall. We treat a lot less respiratory since that has gone in. And I do think that there's something to it um, as far as you know, reducing that bacterial load, that viral load going through the water. Again, um, getting back to you know the, the alertness of the calf, um, the breath of the calf. I just recently had a calf that I was struggling with and she was on again, off again on her milk and I couldn't really wrap my head around her. She didn't have clostridium. She, she was just really kind of um, not an aggressive calf. She would come out looking aggressive, but then look at her milk and go, yeah, not today and go back in her hutch. Um, she, she did that for about two weeks. Um, she was eating, you know, and she was gaining. So I wasn't like cons really concerned, but yet she was always catching my eye as what's going on. Well, she went off of milk for two weeks. A, a quick little story here. She went off of milk for two weeks or two days. And I'm like, sweetheart, you've got to get moving here. We've got to be doing something. And she was about a month of age at that point. I tubed her and the tube would not go down um, her esophagus. So I'm guessing that she probably had a blockage in there. And once I uh, removed that blockage, she has not skipped a beat since, but her breath was terrible. She was almost like an acidic, um, kind of a, a smelly, um, really nasty breath to her. So, um, and then obviously keeping them dry and comfortable, um, not shivering a lot when we're not feeding, um, that's a telltale sign as well that something's going on. And obviously looking at their back end, um, that's just, you know, common knowledge that if their back end is wet, um, you're probably 24 hours behind the event that actually happened. So um, keeping all this in mind, we really have to, to be observant. So, you know, does a calf come out? Does it stretch? Does it play? Um, are the ears, you know, where they need to be? Um, and then again, I, I really look at us that are re raising calves. Um, no matter if you're five calves or 5,000 or 10,000 calves, you have to have the right people in place, right? So are we sensitive to that calf's need and are we observant and are we quiet and calm when we're working at, with these calves? Because, um, boy, we can really have some train wrecks um, with people if we don't have the right people in place. And I've seen it a lot on, on some dairies that we work with. So. Um, it's, it's all about common sense in my book, but not everybody has that availability to, to have the right people um, in their operation for calves. So next. So scours. Um, when we started with the curry that we are at, um, they were having quite a few challenges. We did a lot of necropsies on their farm um, before I even got them. And then once we got them here, we did a lot of electrolytes um, and some diagnostics. They came with a lot of wet butts. Um, their legs were, you know, um, clearly raw from the acidicness of their, their scour. Um, and, and so we really cleaned that up for this dairy. But here again, you know, it's, it's being observant. What does that pile of manure look like in their pen? Um, and how do we evaluate it from there? And so I kind of broke it down, you know, for us, is it putting consistency? Is it water? Can you not see it if it is in their pens? Um, because if, if you can't see it, then we've got bigger issues. But um, or is it chunky? You know, is it is it related to milk, the milk diet we're feeding them? Um, I've heard a lot of producers that I work with that feed whole milk, you know, if they put a lot of fresh cow milk in, um, the calves will, will be aggressive, but they'll have a lot you know, looser manure, it's still okay to do that, but you just have to be cognizant of what you're feeding them and know your limits um, on those calves and the ages of calves. 
And then, um, you know, for us, are we changing the volume at feeding time? Are we changing, you know, the amount that we're feeding, the solid level? Um, or has our milk replacer changed um, its formula? Because sometimes we don't change things here, but the milk replacer, the companies might change their, their fat or they might change their protein um, ingredient source. So it's knowing all of those pieces of the puzzles um, that really, you know, make or break your system as well. The next slide. So some of the things that I, I saw the comment that just came up, um, here's my go-tos, right? So I do use, I, I go to Costco and I buy the biggest box I possibly can of the five hour energy. And um, I've had a lot of producers go, what do you do that for? Well, five hour energy has got some caffeine in it. It's got a lot of vitamin B, which is um, stimulates appetite. And um, with those two in there, it, it really perks the calf up uh, for the next feeding. So a lot of times right now when we're receiving calves um, and that calf comes off the trailer and it's sluggish, it automatically gets a five hour energy. Or if I think a calf is a little bit um, slower at drinking that it usually has, I don't go for a needle right away, I go to my five hour energy. Um, and, and that just stimulates appetite. Um, it's quick, it's easy. Um, it can be a little messy, but for the most part, they drink it and um, you're on to the next event. I do probably do, I would say if uh, someone asked me how many energy shots I use, um, I will use up to three energy shots, 12 hours apart. Um, and then I reevaluate that calf if, if the five hour energy isn't doing its, its job. Um, my next go-to is the Cymic CB boluses. It's a probiotic bolus. And if I do need to treat a calf with an antibiotic, I always follow it up with Cymic. Um, there again, just replenishing good flora in that gut. Um, there again, though, if, if I have a calf that might be a little bit slow on drinking, um, I might just open up the capsule and put the five hour energy in its milk. And um, it's, it's a good product. Um, those are probably my, my go-tos a lot. If I need to tube feed a calf, um, I very rarely take away milk diet because I truly do believe milk is nutrition and electrolytes is fluids especially if I'm you know, dealing with a calf with scours. Um, they still need that nutrition to fight off anything that is prevalent. And I will do a lot of electrolyte therapy after. On our operation, um, I don't even try a bottle. Everything gets tubed electrolytes, a gallon of electrolytes, because a lot of times I think we're um, shorting our calf on fluids going in because there's more fluids going out the back end than we're replenishing it. So they do get a gallon um, of electrolytes twice a day. And um, I do use the blue light C because there is some calcium in there. Um, it, it's a pretty easy product to mix. Um, and if I do need to free choice it, they will drink it. And that tells me a lot too. So the next slide. Uh, so if we do use a bottle, um, I do use the bottle koozies. We've had those custom make. Um, and, and it's all about conserving the temperature um, this time of the year so that we don't um, have cool milk once we get out to the calves. There again, um, calf jackets is a must if you have calves in the cold climate and you don't have a heat source. Um, like I said, I do double jacket in the wintertime um, on preemie calves or calves with low birth weights or if it's an extremely cold event coming through, I will double jackets. Um, I tend to try to leave jackets on as long as possible on my calves here. Um, maybe sometimes too long because it's it's a rodeo once you know they're at that point of weaning to get them off. So if uh, the weather is doable and I think they're a month of age or maybe six weeks of age, um, and they the calf jackets will come off. They can handle it. So. Um, with that being said, on to the next one. So last summer, um, we did a, a trial at our place, a conventional twice a day feeding. Um, 
basically two gallons of milk a day versus um, an ad lib feeding portion. And we did it on bull calves. And there again, I um, both groups, both the ad lib and the conventional had a 13% solid. We targeted that on a 24 milk replacer. And um, the control group, like I said, they, they were fed um, twice a day on a 60 day weaning. They averaged 2.97 pounds of average daily gain. The starter um, intake, they took right off on starter like our calves um, on a typical diet would. We do feed a 20% um, pellet grain mix that's got a little bit of oats in it. Um, they like it and they tell me they like it by these numbers. So I, I don't see us deviating um, away from that. When they're in the hutches, they don't get any hay. When they go into the super condos and the weaning condos, they do get a grass, um, a alfalfa grass hay mix. And um, we start acclimating them to um, a little bit more of a, um, some forage in their ration. But on the trial, on the, the ad lib feeding portion of it, they had unlimited amount of milk every day. And we did put uh, potassium sorbate in their milk just to control bacteria growth. So um, we were interchanging that milk every 12 or 12 hours. So whatever they didn't drink in that 12 hour period went to my weaning pen and I, I watered it down for them. Um, they kind of turned their nose up at it because it did have a different taste to it. But the calves that were on the ad lib diet, um, we averaged about 17 liters of milk into those calves um, for 60 days. And their gains on that were 2.78, um, but they would not take off on starter. Um, weaning process for them was, was quite the challenge. And so, um, you know, they didn't need any extra calories, right? Because they were getting it all through the milk. So with this being said, um, we are gonna continue our conventional program here. I, I love the way that the calves looked on the ad lib program, but you know, and I know that anybody that raises calves, we have to have that transition go as smoothly as possible. And um, I, I wasn't real comfortable with that transition and them not eating a lot of starter once we did that. At the end of four months, we just sold those boys here about a month ago and um, I couldn't tell them apart at the end of four months, but I know on cost of production, um, my conventional was about three, $3 less versus the ad lib feeding program. So that was um, basically seven days to uh, four months. And that's basically it on our operation. Like I said, we're not a big operation here, um, but I definitely love what I do. Um, I also work for a company um, selling calf feeding equipment. So I, I have the best of both worlds here, what I say. So I get to work with producers every day um, that have a passion for calves as well as I get to come home and play with my own, so. Well, thanks, Minnie. I really appreciate that. And a lot of great information there too. So we can give you all a virtual virtual clap as well as we go through here. And um, I'm gonna open up the chat box here as we kind of wrap up here. Um, Minnie, I think I wanna first start with you since we're on your presentation here. And there was a question about, is there a certain age that's best to take the blood samples to test for selenium or other deficiencies? Yes. We, we do total proteins here. Um, so if we get them, like I said, they might be, you know, two days old, they might be seven days old. So usually the window is from, you know, you don't want to go outside that seven or eight day max window on a blood sample on a calf. Um, they start picking up their own proteins at that point. Um, you know, if you can get it at day three or day four, that's ideal. Um, anything that, you know, we've we worked with in the industry, you want to stay under that day eight. And then the electrolyte I use, um, yeah, so I use um, the, the blue light C. Um, I just like that. Um, there's a lot of other products out there and you got to become comfortable with one that you enjoy working with both on a, um, a mixability 
And um, does it, it work in your operation on your cabs? And I'll add, we also love blue light C also. We tried Resorb one time for a little bit and we just did not like it. We went back to the blue light as soon as we could. And yes, many just, just you know. I bet it's a lot easier on the cabs. And they, you know, they respond real fast. But then, like I said, I'm pretty aggressive at electrolyte therapy if needed too. Yeah, and Minnie, when you take those total serum proteins, and let's say you do get a batch of calves that have really low protein levels, what's kind of your, I guess, protocol going back to the dairy and kind of troubleshooting that? Yeah, so if they have low total proteins, and, and we have experienced this in the past with um, a dairy we raised for, it's, I mean, it goes back to colostrum, right? Right? the consistency of the colostrum, the, um, you know, the timing of feeding colostrum, um, the process that you're warming or pasteurizing that colostrum, there is a process to it. Um, and so I, I can appreciate where Erin is coming from, from the bag end of it, because it's, it's simple, um, because there is a few more steps on your homegrown colostrum. But I think you pick up a lot more um, IgG levels in your homegrown um, it, it's, um, that's why you vaccinate dry cows is to absorb all those good IgGs from, um, that colostrum. But yeah, so when I go back to the dairy, I, I really, you know, make sure that they're tubing them correctly as well. Um, so we're not getting any aspiration with that tubing process, but it all goes back to, are we getting it in there quick enough? Is the quality of the colostrum, this dairy, um, will not. Um, check their, their quality of their colostrum. Um, they've got too many people in charge of colostrum feeding. So um, it's everybody else's, you know, problem, right? So I, once we get them here, we try to do the best um, that we can do to make sure that those calves thrive and, and gain and uh, go back to the dairy um, with what they do best and that's milk. Thanks, Minnie. And Carissa, I think there was a question up here for you. Um, how often do you get hematomas on the tail from the blood draws? Um, occasionally, I'll see like a bubble form, like right after I take the blood sample, but I really, I really hardly ever notice any problems with them. And then Aaron had a question about the age that you brand your heifers because they look really easy to read on the heifers. Oh yeah. So we used to always wait until the heifers returned to the dairy. So they were, you know, shortly before calving or had already calved and we would brand twice a year at Easter and at Thanksgiving. And it was just this whole big deal. We'd get out a shoot, we'd run them through a shoot one at a time. It took one, two, it took like four or five people. Another two people would be sorting and it was, it was a deal. Well, then we installed those headlocks over at our heifer facility. And one day we had the idea, we're like, hey, let's just try this. Let's try branding heifers in the headlocks. And it worked amazingly. So we do that now twice a year. We just go over one day and we spend the whole day just freeze branding. And so they're mm, probably minimum 10 months. Um, once in a while, there'll be one in that pen that just seems a little bit too small. You know, the the brands won't quite fit on her butt like they should. So we skip her and wait till she's older. But typically between, oh, probably 10 to 15 months old is probably when we're doing them. And, and yeah, it's, we started that probably two years ago and it's been working amazing. So much easier. And we freeze brand. And if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the box there. I do have um, some questions for Aaron. Um, one is, do you ever try to put duct tape on the, the calves ears when you, when you do the paste just to kind of protect them a little bit, or do you just let them, let them be? So we're, it's part of our brand new calf. So any, we have three warm rooms. So as soon as they're running around good, they're thrown into the next warm room. So we don't have everybody who's in that first warm room, they're just sleeping, they're not moving. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, a, 
five or six years ago when we started, we did because we had more calves in that room. We weren't doing them as soon as they were born. And so, yeah, we tried taping and we had it on the eyes. It was kind of a mess, but I think the best thing is to do it right after they have their classroom. So they're not running around and uh, we don't have any problems. And then my other question for you, Aaron, is you were talking about um, raising those beef, beef calves. How, um, what age do you raise them up to? And do you have a buyer that uh, buys them at a certain age for you? Yeah, so what we're doing is Transova Genetics is making those embryos from the semen that the farm that will, the feedlot that will take them back from us is giving them. So they're, they're specifically their embryos and their calves, and they'll leave here at three months is when they, they come and pick them up. So every week they come, so they're fun. They're, they're beefy, it's a lot different than a Jersey. We'll have like one Jersey in the same warm room that is 44 pounds and then a beef one that's 92. So yeah, a lot different. And I don't know if it's profitable yet. Ask me in a year, okay. <laughs> we can look at this project. Right. <laughs> I saw that you have headlocks for in your calf pen. You, it, you said that I think they drink their bottles through headlocks. What, uh, like, what yes. was your reasoning for putting headlocks in as opposed to just a slant bar? Well, we were all, we came from all auto feeders and uh, we left the auto feeders about five, six years ago. And we're just looking for a way to stay in the group pens but have a simpler way so that whoever was feeding calves could pick out the calves that needed attention. So in the auto feeder, it was a little bit difficult to have a person know how to use that, but here it's the bottle is half full still, or she left an inch or she drank it all, you know? So it just worked a lot better as far as managing them. I, if we had just a bar, they would all like, we would have no idea how much anybody drank. They're absolutely bad shit crazy <laughs> when they're drinking. So yeah, they definitely have to be in the headlocks for us to have any organization as to who drank what. But we still get the advantage of the group situation, having a shared automatic water, skid loader bedding. And so that's kind yeah, of where that idea came from. That's really cool. I've never seen anything odd. quite like that before. <laughs> It works, we're happy, I'm happy with it. I'm building another barn with them, so. But these are pens of 18, which was a little much, um, obviously with uh, trying to be money tight on everything, we'll have smaller pens of nine. That way we can really wean on a closer time period. Instead of with the 18 and having the beef calves in there, we can end up with somebody we're waiting like four or five extra days so that we can wean the whole group. So go to smaller pens is our only change. We don't Thanks. mix the beef calves with the jerseys. Thanks, Erin. And then Carissa, I just had one last question for you. Um, you. When you take those blood samples and you mail them in, what if you see a cow or a heifer in heat during that time that you're waiting? Do you just wait till you get the result back or what do you, what do you do? Well, it uh, kind of just depends if, if it's somebody that's like wearing a collar, we'll look at her graph and see if her graph looks legit or if she's just goofing off and, and then we'll examine the animal itself. If she really, you know, if she's got marks on her where other cows have been riding her and left, you know, dirty poopy footprints on her back, if she's all sweaty, if she's got a good mucus, then yeah, for sure we'll breed her. Um, it's kind of just a case by case basis, yeah. you know, look at, look at the animal and, and uh, evaluate what you think and, and go from there. So, yeah. And typically when you do that, let's say you, you breed a heifer and then you get those results back, are they, do you normally get it right? Or how does, well, that's one issue over at the heifer facility. Okay. Uh, we've got collars on all of those heifers, but I, we don't think our settings are set quite right for heifers over there because there are a lot of repeat breedings that don't need to be happening. Um, and I think it's coming from those collars. The collars are showing a heat at like 12 and 15 days 
after a previous heat and then I'm blood sampling some of those and I know that they've been bred again but I just want to see for myself you know and they're actually coming back as pregnant to previous breedings and so that's that's our uh, most challenging area is with the heifers over there so okay so if a cow is cystic will the collars they kind of develop a pattern to say hey you know, basically every three days this cow is in heat or how do you go about finding those cows? Yeah, you'll, you'll see it on, on the graph, but honestly, we haven't had a cystic cow in so long. I remember we used to be dealing with them a lot and we just, I can't remember the last time that we've had one like that. And I don't know, I know we've changed our time to AI protocol so we've actually like backed it up and we're waiting till almost day 60 in milk before she gets any PGH. And then we're doing like three PGH shots and then um, GNRH and then breeding. And we're not using cedars except on cows that actually come back open. That's when we would use a cedar. Um, but yeah, since we've been doing our time diet protocol that way, I really haven't haven't had any cystic cows. It's a super good thing. <laughs> Maybe your well, next presentation can be on that. My boss wanted me to talk about like our changes to our time to eye protocol. And I'm like, well, I could, but I, I know what I do. I just don't always know how to explain it all exactly, you know, but since we've kind of made little changes here and there with it and it seems to be working really really well because everyone is coming back pregnant like a lot of calves <laughs> good problem mm -hmm. all right well i know it is a little past 115 um but i really appreciate both carissa minnie and aaron for both of you three presenting your presentations, really great information. I think it's just really cool that we can get on farm and, and demonstrate some of what you're actually doing and relate that back to other uh, dairy producers and particularly this group with the dairy women's group. So um, I just, it's a good connection to make there, but um, you'll notice in the chat box, I did put the link to our previous webinars. So uh, I'll get this record, or I'll get this archived and then I'll send you out the link to today's presentation along with PDFs of the uh, presentations. And then I did put an evaluation link in for today's program. So if you're able to click on that now, you could take that uh, while you're here. Otherwise I will put it into, a, into an email at the end and mail it out to everybody to, to take that. That helps us with our programs and just um, really lets me know what kind of topics we should you know, try to focus on to, to, to deliver back out. So um, if there's not any other comments, I just, again, thanks for the three to be on and look forward to doing more programming like this and hopefully we can get back into the barn soon. So hopefully everybody stays warm and enjoy your day. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thank you.